Um, for our next speaker, I'm old, I'll admit it. I've been here for a while. One of the great joys, certainly being a professor, is seeing students develop and go on and do wonderful things. There's also a joy in working with young faculty that come in and seeing them mature into more mature researchers and become senior in their own right. Uh, for example, uh, Dong Yan Zhu, who you've heard from, coming in as an assistant professor. I worked with him some and his students and saw him develop into leading the, as director of Sirius. Well, our next speaker is someone came in as an assistant professor, worked with, saw great things from him, from his students. Uh, we've had an opportunity to interact over the last few years. He's now a professor in electrical and computer engineering. He's director of two centers, uh, CRISP, which is the Center on Resiliency and Infrastructure Systems and Processes, and the Army uh, AI Innovation Institute. Um, he's got a number of awards, including IBM and Google Faculty Awards, the Alexander von Humboldt Award, uh, and he's finishing up a term on the IEEE uh, Board of Governors. So he's a senior leader in the field, leading some associated centers, uh, part of the Sirius ecosystem as well. And it's with great pleasure I introduce my colleague, Professor Sora Bagshi. All right, is the audio coming through? All right. Thank you, Spaf, for those warm words. Uh, those are the kinds of words which make you think, is he talking about you or somebody else? I think he is talking about me. Um, I have a presentation on uh, an internet of secure things. So we are in the business of scaring people with all the insecurities that are there. I'm here to cast a more positive light and saying we are, I think, heading, albeit with the bumps on the road toward an internet of secure things. Uh, a meta comment I would make is it's a longish presentation. I would uh, encourage if there are any questions, comments, especially opposing comments, you just raise your hand and I'll try to get you even during the talk. Uh, and the slides will be made available so you can uh, watch them, see them later on as well. So, I'm going to break this talk down into four major parts. Uh, in the first part is the high level part where I'm going to talk about what does it mean to secure cyber physical system applications? What are some of the motivations, the high level uh, technical challenges? And then spend a little bit of time about engineered systems. So uh, I think to the point Ruby was making earlier, these systems are not going to be sitting in your labs or in clinical or, or in sanitized data centers. They're going to be out in the world. So when you apply them in engineered systems, what kinds of new challenges come up? And then I'm going to go into a little bit of detail in these two aspects. How do you secure interdependent cyber physical systems? The operational word there is interdependency. And then how do you secure data-driven or stochastic cyber physical systems? And I'll leave you with some uh, weighty thoughts and insights. All right, so from a 30, 40,000 feet view, uh, when you talk about cyber physical systems, they're often composed of hardware and software blocks that are not inherently reliable or inherently secure. Further, they are operated by people not quite like you and me. They're often operated by people who don't have advanced degrees in computing. And all of them, including us, we have different kinds of cognitive biases as we approach the problem of securing any large scale system. So we have to create cyber physical systems out of these kinds of imperfections. So here is a question for you. If you count up the number of embedded devices which are out there in the world, and it's a bit of a squishy number, and if you count up the number of human beings on this planet, which one do you think comes out ahead? How many of you think it's the embedded devices? All right, how many of you think humans have the advantage there in terms of numbers? No one? Okay, so I'm preaching to the choir here. So it turns out it's about 15 times. The number of embedded devices out there in the world is about 15 times. 
And again, I think Ruby made this point that a lot of these are going to be legacy assets. So you don't have this uh, magic wand where you can say that I'm going to weave this magic wand and all of these devices, 8 billion times 15, are going to have this latest security technique that we've come up with here at Sirius. Okay? Now, one thing that is complicated matters for us is embedded devices would traditionally be not continuously network connected. They were sort of air gapped in, in jargon terms. But nowadays, there is increasing reliance on these being continuously connected, sometimes over even high bandwidth connections. So this increase in connectivity is increased significantly the threat landscape that we have to deal with, the attack surface that we have to deal with. The second important problem uh, challenge in here is that rarely are these embedded devices used in isolation in creating any reasonable cyber physical system. They are used with complex interdependencies among these devices. And with these complex interdependencies come with it organizational structures. So for example, one entity owns, operates, manages some part of the cyber physical system, another entity manages another one. So even when these entities are collaborating, they're all good guys, they're the white hats, even then there are going to be incentive mismatches between these organizations. And what you do to protect your part of the CPS application affects my security. So that is a high level problem uh, that the community broadly is, chal is challenged with. And the third one is these cyber physical systems are increasingly be being used in autonomous systems where human beings are either completely out of the loop or on the loop or in some cases in the loop which means that they are increasingly making decisions based on emergent patterns, based on how the data is being fed into these systems. And as many of us know, if you have to secure a deterministic system, that's one thing. If you have to secure a stochastic, a data-driven system, that significantly raises the bar for what we can do. Okay? So at a high level, these are the three challenges which have emerged, are emerging, which introduce significantly novel problem definitions for us. All right. So now let's drill down one level deeper to see what are the technical challenges from these high level problem contexts that I laid out. So here you have to deal with the fact that there is a very large deployed software base out there. Much of it is written, for example, in unsafe C. Much of it is written with the premise that the entire software is able to access the entire hardware. There are no protection domains in there, okay? So um, our basic security class with SPAF teaches, you know that's a bad idea for creating secure systems. You don't run all the software as root all the time, but that is a fact of life in here. Then we all know of basic security techniques where hardware can be used to enforce certain kinds of protection. So for example, you can have address space randomization, which relies on a memory management unit being in the picture. Some of these cyber physical system devices don't have that kind of hardware. So that ties your hands up. Now, if you think about the second aspect of the problem, the large scale interdependent CPS, there are legacy assets, which have significant amount of uh, expenses that have been sunk costs in these assets, so you cannot just throw them out. Uh, you will have multiple stakeholders, and these stakeholders, even when they are C-suite executives, will have their cognitive biases. So the one realization we had when we started on this work is algorithms can be unbiased, but these kinds of security decision making is not done purely by algorithms. They're often involving human stakeholders who are deciding I want to secure this part of the infrastructure and not this part, and partially this part. So these kinds of decision-making comes with a set of cognitive biases. And importantly, um, these stepping stone attacks are a fact of life in this domain. What do stepping stone attacks mean? By the way, just to get a sense of the crowd, stepping stone attacks, does the word term mean anything to anyone? All right, so a few of you. So let me explain what this means. So it means that you have some crown jewel, which you're not exposed to the outside world. So you have the, the analogy of the moat, is you have a moat. The moat can, of course, be breached. 
but your crown jewel is not there right next to the moat. The crown jewel is hidden in a castle high up. But an adversary can compromise some element of your system, elevate her privileges, use these elevated privileges to go to the next one, hence the analogy of a stepping stone, and ultimately the crown jewel or the crown jewels in your system become compromised. And this is the most common way in which any reasonably complex CPS application is attacked today. Okay. And on the third aspect, the CPS and autonomous systems, what we have to deal with there is the trend that has revolutionized the world, machine learning. We love it, we hate it. In the security domain, there is a lot to love about it because it has helped us in creating more secure systems by updating our defenses based on emergent patterns. But there's also a lot to hate about the onset of machine learning in our CPS systems. Because any kind of deterministic rules that you would come up with for securing these systems now get thrown out the window. Because the behavior of these systems emerge. They emerge in somewhat unpredictable ways. Unpredictable because they're dependent on the data input, data access patterns. And uh, hence the behavior being less deterministic, which we can all appreciate, challenges our security posture. All right, so let's get some, put some meat behind these technical parts. And uh, now I'm going to be rather parochial and talk about work, not, not just within my group, but within uh, the group of faculty members that I work with uh, in this space. So let's again think about those three aspects of securing cyber physical system applications and drill them down. Securing individual devices, securing interconnected networks of devices, and then securing devices systems which are stochastic in nature. So with respect to securing individual devices, broadly the community has been able to come up with static and dynamic analysis techniques that can be used with current embedded devices. So we are not posturing that this is only for some speculative future kinds of devices which have all these magical kinds of hardware or software base, but with existing devices. So for example, this uh, kinds of attacks that we learn of in our graduate level security class, like memory hijacking attacks, memory corruption vulnerabilities, we have been able to largely address them. Now there is a very key requirement when you have to build in defenses against these kinds of attacks. That key requirement is you cannot expect developer effort in making these changes. In other words, this is to be automated to the process where you take your binary, you lift your binary to a source code or an assembly level, you pass it through a compiler, and these kinds of defenses automatically get embedded when you do that. Anything that would require application developer involvement is going to be a no-no in this space, okay? So that has been achieved. Now, of course, if you want the gory details, you can read all these papers, which we spent hours of blood, sweat, and tears writing, all right? So next is, uh, we can also utilize state-of-the-art testing techniques, which are very customized for these kinds of embedded devices in order to prevent memory corruption errors. Often in these kinds of high consequential systems, it's not enough for you to detect it after the fact. It's very important for you to prevent these errors from showing up fail in, as failures in the first place. Um, and then this was actually work done with Sandia, which is uh, something called binary rehosting. So um, this is somewhat uh, deep in the weeds, but let me give you the high level feel for this. Is uh, our, our collaborators at Sandia said, we are often handed firmware pieces and said, go and tell me what is the security property of this firmware piece. Now, this firmware piece needs some very esoteric kinds of hardware to execute on them, okay? So maybe it runs on 100 different, uh, there's one kind of firmware for each kind of storage controller, okay? Now, each kind of storage media, I don't have access to that when I'm doing my security testing. So the technique that the community has come up with for handling this is called binary rehosting. What is What that means, it's a fancy word for saying, I can take your firmware, and I can run it on my Linux server. 
I don't need access to that kind of esoteric hardware in order to test this. So we've done work in that, and, and this is a very active area in the community broadly. Okay, so that's on the first part, uh, the contribution on securing CPS devices. Any quick thoughts, comments? People still following along? All right. All right, so the next part is on securing interdependent CPS. So here, the target that we have is uh, large-scale cyber-physical systems, which have interdependencies among the different pieces, and these are owned by multiple stakeholders. So not the entire application doesn't have a single owner. Okay? Um, and the decision-making, in some cases, is algorithm, algorithmic, but in some other cases is done by human decision makers. Mm -hmm. So we were the first really to bring in this idea of behavioral decision making in how do you make security resource allocation. So this, by the way, is a 2002 Nobel Prize in economics. I had never thought that I would have to read economics textbooks in order to, after high school, to do security work, but I did. Uh, and in fact, the proponent of this Daniel Kahneman, he just passed away last week. Um, and then there was another Nobel Prize about 10 years after that on this notion of behavioral economics. What does that mean? That means the 99% of economics deals with people making completely rational decisions. Okay? But we being humans, we carry with us a whole baggage of biases. So now the question is, this has been studied in the economics literature, the question is when human decision makers have to make decisions about which security assets to secure, which ones to leave as is, the prioritization part that Ruby was making, and which ones to secure to what point. These are not binary decisions. If I put in $100 or $1,000 or a $1 million in securing an asset. So what is the effect of behavioral decision-making biases in the overall security your application has? So as a bit of a teaser, I would say, what kinds of biases do people make when they make security decisions? So this was, it's well said that a lot of study of, uh, Economics is a study of undergraduate students in colleges because we can't afford to go out and recruit all of you professionals for our studies, so we do it with undergraduate students. We went a little bit better. We also recruited some graduate students to see what kinds of biases they have. Okay, so two kinds of biases in security decision making came up. One is we tend to um, overplay or overestimate some very low probability events. Okay? So an extreme case of this is uh, I had somebody who wouldn't fly with his wife on a plane. Why? Because if the plane crashed, then their kids would all be orphans. Okay? So this is a very low probability event, and I would knock on the wood for that. And we tend to underestimate some high probability event. So we would be going around in our cars, and we would be eating with one hand, putting lipstick with the other hand, and feel that it's per perfectly safe. And getting behind the wheels of a car is probably the most dangerous thing you're going to do. Somewhat to a surprise, the similar kind of a behavioral bias cropped up in the security decision making. Okay? So we set it up as a game whereby you have uh, an attack graph and you have some crown jewels in your system, like very proprietary data or one control system, which if you bring down, then the entire CPS application goes down. And certain edges, which really had a high likelihood of attack, people were not investing as much, okay? So that was one bias. And the second bias is called a spreading heuristic. So this is something which is inbuilt into us because we've heard this saying a million times is don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? It turns out that's not a perfectly good saying when it turns, comes to securing your CPS application. So think of it like an attack graph. Now, in the attack graph, as you are trying to reach the crown jewels, there are going to be a few critical edges. If you disrupt the attack on those critical edges, then your crown jewels are secure. So actually putting a lot of your investment on those critical edges turns out to be a very good kind of a security heuristic. And the spreading bias that we carry with us told us to do otherwise. Um, then we didn't just study this, we also came up with certain mechanisms whereby we could mitigate the effects of these biases. So the mitigation happens in two ways. One is a learning-based mitigation. So as you're playing this game many, many times, and you're learning from the attacks that are succeeding and the attacks that are being thwarted. 
So we can provide a nice dashboard, which is learning in the machine learning sense, which says these kinds of investments have a higher likelihood of securing your system, and these other kinds are more likely to be useless. And the other guidance on mitigating these negative effects of biases is a tax-based mechanism. So this work has been very influential in that California has picked this up, and our Federal Highway Administration has picked this up in uh, guiding what kinds of investments or security insurance you have to buy. Okay. And the third piece of this puzzle is uh, when you have multiple defenders, and these defenders have cooperation, but also competition among them. So think of utilities. They have cooperation for the most part, but they also have some uh, blend of competition among them. So when you have these kinds of multiple partially cooperating entities, how do you incentivize them so as to improve the overall security of your system? Let's see how we're doing on time. All right, I'm, t I'm 20 minutes in. I have a total of 40 minutes. OK. Um, so questions? Question? Hi. Uh, oh, my question is, what are the limitations to the CPS? What do you mean by limitations? Like uh, 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 how far it can uh, like protect and what it can do, can or can do. Okay, so this, of course, is very specific to the context. Um, so in some kinds of cyber physical system applications like connected and autonomous transportation systems, we found that if you are the vendor, if you're the NVIDIAs of the world, you could lock down the software that runs on your NVIDIA chip very well. Okay? But in, in the case of connected autonomous transportation, you're also reliant on communication with other entities, with other vehicles or with roadside units. So there you are reliant on a cellular infrastructure or a Wi-Fi infrastructure. So those tend to be much more variable. And, and failures, like is well known, arise at the composition of multiple kinds of small element level failures. So just your wireless bandwidth going down is not in reason enough to cause a catastrophic failure. But that going down plus congestion because of many cars in one region, that leads to a catastrophic failure. Question? I was just wondering, how does this compare against uh, more game theoretic techniques like uh, Melintombe's Stackelberg games, which is limited um, defender resources in security resource allocation, but in more physical systems like he, what he designed manages security for LAX? Yeah, so this very much plays into that. In fact, we refer to Millen's work a lot in that. We rely on Stackelberg games as well in this. There are two distinctive factors. One is, for the most part, they haven't taken into account this kind of behavioral biases in the security decision making. Yeah. And the second one is, um, yeah, so we can get into the details. And I, Actually, our security and privacy work does a direct comparison as well. And the second piece of this puzzle is, here we are looking at responding in real time, not just in machine time. So then this, this loop of, seeing the sensor measurement, running your game theoretic model and coming up with a response have to be done very, very fast. All right, moving along. So now the third piece of this puzzle, how do you do distributed ML processing among cyber physical system devices, okay? So here the, the name of the game is, there are many, many cyber physical system devices. Our goal is to make them quote unquote smart which means that they should be able to ingest relatively complex machine learning models and be able to operate these relatively complex machine learning models. But individual devices are weak. They're constrained in terms of their compute power, in terms of their memory, in terms of the network connectivity to the mothership. So what do you do? What you do is a form of distributed machine learning, federated learning being the most common exemplar for that, but we are looking at much more nuanced, much more complex forms of this, like peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning or hier hierarchical learning. Now, the fact of the life there is that individual devices are going to be untrusted and unreliable. So how do you learn a machine learning model by, by collecting the wisdom of the crowds, but individual elements in the crowds are going to be untrustworthy or unreliable? So that's the focus of our Asia CCS paper from last year. 
And then how do you analyze the privacy of the local data while they're participating in some form of distributed learning? So one of the hopes of distributed learning was on the privacy side is that you can keep your local data private and you don't have to share that local data with the mothership, with the server, with the aggregator. All that you have to share is some updates to the gradients that you are calculating based on your local data. So this was a great thing because then multiple organizations, which again have this frenemy relationship could collaborate because they're not having to share their data with you, um, but they're still able to learn models which individually they would not be able to learn. So going back about five years, uh, there's a very famous paper from Duke which came out which showed that this promise is no longer true. So that led to a whole arms race which is still going on, is how do you keep private data private when you are doing decentralized learning. And our SNP paper is going to be uh, presented this May, and our CVPR paper shows uh, we are the black hats in this case, that even the latest kind of homomorphic encryption is unable to prevent the privacy, protect the privacy, if the aggregator is able to give you customized models. So if the aggregator says to client one, I'm going to send you this model, to client two, I'm going to send you this model, then it's possible to break that kind of privacy as well. And then uh, the third piece is decentralized learning. So here we have to go beyond just federated learning and we have to go into a peer-to-peer -peer forms of learning. So they are uh, a mixed blessing. So peer-to-peer -peer learning is a blessing in the sense you're no longer relying on one aggregator to do the heavy lifting for you. And one aggregator, if he becomes nosy, curious, then privacy can break down. So that's the good news part of it. But the bad news part of it is with decentralized learning, a few strategically introduced adversaries can completely break down your learning. So imagine that you have an adversarial node which has a high degree of centrality. So it's very well connected. So this one can sort of spread the contagion and break down decentralized learning. So this is a big open problem in the community today, and we're working hard in solving this. All right, so now I'll make a bit of a segue into placing all of this work in the context of engineered systems that we have worked with. So this is stepping up to a higher level of abstraction. Before I go there, any questions on what we have covered so far? All right. So with engineered systems, we said, let's take all of this uh, nice work that we are doing on CPS security and take it for a spin out in the real world with all the messiness of the real world. See how much of it stands up and how much of it crumples. Now, we were humbled in this that a lot of our assumptions were in fact turned out to be wrong when we took it out into the real world. And this is after we had been doing experiments with with fairly realistic settings even in our labs. But, and I'll share with you some of those uh, gotcha stories as well as some of the stories where we were able to succeed. So one domain is advanced manufacturing uh, where we have uh, collaboration with a whole bunch of local manufacturers here in the state of Indiana, which have uh, these kinds of machines which are advanced manufacturing machines in that they're controllable through programmatically. So forget your notion of old world factory floors where human beings are pushing buttons and knobs. These are all programmatically controlled. And it's a nice workflow where you have machine one, which passes it on to machine two, which does its thing. And scarcely a human being on that floor unless something goes wrong. So what we've done there is these machines have lots and lots of different kinds of sensors. So for example, they're measuring the vibration pattern, they're measuring even audio, they're measuring uh, the video feeds. And from this, your goal is to be able to do anomaly detection. So for the most part, this anomaly happens because of naturally occurring failures, but you can easily put on your imagination hat and think about security gaps as well, which would cause maybe a machine to slow down or to speed up in an unsafe manner. So by putting all of these sensor feeds together, the goal is to be able to do an anomaly detection. And it turns out that when we started this work going back four or five years, these machines were more deterministic. So you could come up with rule-based anomaly detection techniques, which says, if the rate of increase in this motor speed was greater than this, that's cause for concern. Somebody better come in and take a look. But now these machines have also gotten more stochastic. 
And therefore, we've had to come up with even models like transformer models to ingest the sensor inputs from all these different kinds of sensors to tell two things. So there are two things which are very important. One is, which machine is it that's beginning to malfunction? And two is, if nothing is done, when would it fail? And unless you have the answer to both of these questions, any kind of security work you do in advanced manufacturing is not very useful. Uh, and then back in the dark days of the pandemic, we came up with different techniques in order to do proximity detection in a privacy preserving manner. You could always do this with Google and Apple's technology, but then you're giving away your, uh, all your data to them um, using uh, proximity sensors, which people wore on things like this. All right. So the next uh, spin in the real world was in this thing, which is uh, the jargon is industry 4.0, where you have to create digital twins of industrial IoT equipped machines so that people can do various kinds of training exercises in the lab. Not all your 10,000 employees have to go out onto the factory floor and actually be interacting with these physical machines. And it turns out this digital twin has a very important use case for security testing. So instead of going and poking in the actual machines, you could go and inject various kinds of errors in the digital twin in the cyber world and try to investigate what kinds of security vulnerabilities there are. Um, so that, that has been a, an active area of work in our group as well as broadly in the community. So we have this nice test bed with different kinds of motors and rotors where you can inject controllable kinds of failures. You could slow it down, you could disbalance it, and so on. Um, and the third one is um, something in precision agriculture, where uh, the failure mode that we learned is uh, something which this community may have heard of called Byzantine failures. Byzantine failures are these security kinds of failures where you have multiple bad guys which work together they collude in order to throw off your overall system. So you think, how? why would you have Byzantine failures in this kind of an environment? So it turns out if you let a system run for a long enough period of time, even the natural failures can line up in such a way that this leads to Byzantine failures. So the best use case here was squirrels chewing at the wires in this setting. So three squirrels which act in a Byzantine manner and chew at the right wires at the wrong time can lead to catastrophic failures in here. All right, so we came up with, uh, with a variety of techniques. Uh, this is an NSF project that's undergoing on um, how do you do distributed protocols in these kinds of settings where energy is a big, big issue. You cannot do your traditional uh, synchronization protocols or traditional Byzantine agreement protocols because then your devices would run out of battery in a 10th of the time that it would usually do, okay? Um, and then another big one is you want these kinds of devices to be remotely reprogrammable. You don't want to have to chase all these devices, go in, bring them back into the lab and reflash them. So this notion of wireless reprogramming has been around, with us, around us for about 10 years. But then the big open question was how do you do secure wireless reprogramming? Because you absolutely don't want an adversary to be able to get untrusted code onto your devices by reflashing them remotely. And then we were able to come up with a way to do this kind of secure wireless reprogramming. So to give you a sense that this really is a messy world, you can see that we had to go in and put these kinds of sensors off in bogs and lakes and ponds, measuring things like nitrate concentrations. And then you had to really worry about things which don't in the lab. device is underground, if we don't extend the antenna, then uh, we cannot get any message from the receiver. So, 
by extending the antenna, uh, we can set up a connection between the node and the receiver. All right. So I'm 33 minutes into uh, the high level stuff, but I think that's time well spent because you can always read the details in the in the papers or the, have the slide deck available to you. Before I delve into a little bit of the details on securing interdependent CPS, are there any comments, questions, thoughts? Are you implementing AI in the system? So not in the one that you saw in here, but of course, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, cyber physical systems are increasingly getting smarter. So it's routine that they run even fairly advanced models like deep transformer models on them to try to react to sensory data that's coming into them. Any others? All right. So securing interdependent C CPSs, what is the big picture in there? Is that we are connecting all of these individual devices and and worryingly connecting all of them to the internet. So this air gapping notion, which used to be the dominant one in the CPS world is no longer true. So when, when you're trying to secure systems like this, then you do have to rely on human decision-making. And there are papers up the wazoo on, on perfectly rational human decision-making, which has a perfect understanding of the risk and a perfect understanding of the reward of any security mechanism that you put in place. But out in the messy real world, human beings, except for those in this room, are all partly rational. Or a nicer way of saying that is they are really, ir human beings are irrational. Um, and they deviate from these classical models of risk reward and perfect utilitarianism. Um, so the big thing in economics, was uh, prospect theory, and uh, Daniel Kahneman is the one who passed away last week. Uh, and then um, this really brought in this notion in economics of how do you do um, human biases in this? So let me give you a little bit of concrete context in here. So this is a fairly simple graph, but it captures one very dominant form of bias human beings have when making security decisions. So what you have on the y-axis is the perceived probability of attack on any edge in your attack graph. And what you have on the x-axis is the true probability of the attack. So if we were all perfectly rational, what do you think that line would look like? Anyone? It would be a diagonal with a slope of 45 degrees. So the perceived probability would be exactly equal to the true probability, which is given by this blue straight line. And you'll see this parameter alpha so the reason this model has been very successful in the literature is because it characterizes using a single parameter, alpha. So if your alpha is equal to one, then it's perfectly rational behavior. And as your alpha becomes closer and closer to zero, it deviates farther and farther from this diagonal line. So um, it's impolite apparently to call them as biased or unbiased. So the correct terms is behavioral and non-behavioral. So non-behavioral means rational, unbiased, Behavioral means biased. Is there a question? Spreading by spreading. So is that what you're... Looking so that's not captured by this model. This model only captures the first of the two biases that I mentioned. Good question. Um, so, so here is some uh, human studies that we did is um, with 145 students. So they're given attack graphs that are created by NIST and NEST score okay, uh, for realistic cyber physical systems. And we identify what are the crown jewels in there and you're given a certain budget, go and invest in specific edges. So what you see here is that there are some critical edge units, that, that thing of putting all your eggs in one basket. If you invested in those critical edge units, that's the best thing to do. So the perfectly rational ones would put a very high uh, investment on those, but those who are more behavioral would do less so. So we found about three quarters of the subjects did exhibit behavioral biases in there. Now, another important question is, as you're doing this over and over again, do you improve? Do you learn? And of course we learn, so there is a positive trend in here, but that positive trend is not as high as one would have imagined. So this actually gives us some pause for thought and that 
when you provide some feedback to these human operators, you have to tell them why your investment failed, not just the binary decision saying your investment security investment failed, but also why it failed. Okay, and this one shows the spreading heuristic bias, whereby, you know, um, there are a lot of details in here which are not important, but there are certain, certain edges in your attack graph which are completely useless. It doesn't matter whether you protect it or not. You, in fact, you shouldn't protect it and put your investments in other places. So we found that about 80% uh, of the subjects are spreaders in the sense that they are investing even in these useless edges. And there the learning is much less obvious. It's a much more of a horizontal line in there, right? All right, so I'm going to, in the three minutes I have left, I'm just going to go to the end and leave you with some insights and takeaways. All right, so this is a fancy rendering of an embedded device, uh, one sitting in our lab. And uh, you can believe it that we have all of these tools to poke and prod these devices to understand really what are their vulnerabilities, both of the software and on the hardware side. So we have some reasonable techniques for protecting them. Okay? Now, protecting them is a two-edged thing. It's not just protection, but it's protection under certain resource constraints. You cannot say that my protection mechanism is going to need eight gigs of memory when there is only uh, one gig of memory on that entire board. Okay? You cannot say that it's going to increase the running time of my execution by 2x, because these are soft real-time and sometimes hard real-time systems. So on, with modulo those constraints, we know how to protect it. Now put this kind of a device in a more complex, and this is, uh, a futuristic rendering of a connected and autonomous transportation system with cars, flying cars, drones, roadside units. Uh, and then here, obviously, we cannot protect every part of your cyber or physical infrastructure. So there is very active work going on, including in our center, on how do you protect partially some of them. So this is full protection, partial protection, and leave some other parts unprotected. So that's the prioritization, which again, I think Ruby's talk talked about. And you need to be able to do this prioritization in a rational, scientific manner, algorithmic manner. And we've, we've shown how to do that. So now let's think about the takeaways. So firstly, when you're talking about device level security for cyber physical system devices, you have to look at determinism. Okay, So it should always work. So that's deterministic security at that level. But when you're talking about data-driven cyber-physical systems, then you have to rely on machine learning models with all their flaws, with all the non-determinism, with all the worst case behavior that they don't handle, you still have to rely on them. Okay. And when you're talking about large-scale cyber-physical systems with humans involved in the security decision-making, you have to take into account game-theoretic models with human cognitive biases in them. And importantly, in the CPS world, you have to do all of this with understanding of the resource constraints that are going to tie your hands behind your back. That's it. Thank you.